Hey friend, when was the last time you listened to a podcast that told you everything you needed to know to break into or do your work in the field of continuing medical education and continuing education for health professionals? If it's been a hot minute, or like never, you've arrived at the right podcast. In fact, you've arrived at Right Medicine, a weekly podcast that explores best practices in creating content that connects with and educates health professionals. Are you feeling stuck in your work? Are you looking for inspiration from your peers? Are you looking for a way to break into this incredibly rewarding and intellectually satisfying field? Well, Right Medicine is here to offer you guidance and strategies as you navigate all phases of CME and CE creation. Every Wednesday, join me, Alex Housen, a medical writer specializing in CME and CE content creation as I host thoughtful, provocative, and rich conversations with guests about adult learning, content creation techniques, effective formats in CME and CE, and trends in healthcare that influence the type of content we create. Right Medicine is here to motivate you to learn and grow as a CME and CE professional, wherever you are in the content creation process. If your work involves planning, designing, creating, delivering or evaluating education for health professionals. This podcast is for you. If you work in CME, especially in oncology, then sooner or later you're going to consult American Cancer Society resources. But how much do you know about the history of this organization? And how much do you know about Mary Lasker? and her contributions to cancer research. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Right Medicine, the podcast that explores best practices in creating continuing education content for health professionals. I'm your host, Alex Housen, and in today's episode, we explore a story that shaped the field of medicine and cancer research in particular. My guest is Judy Pearson, an author, cancer survivor, and catalyst for change herself who shares her extensive research on Mary Lasker, a woman whose name might not be widely known, but whose impact on cancer research and treatment is immeasurable. We explore how Mary's partnership with her husband, Albert Lasker, played a pivotal role in transforming the American Society for the Control of Cancer into what is now known as the American Cancer Society. Mary believed in the power of research and was determined to use her life, her money, and her social connections to make a difference, and was dedicated to education, civic-mindedness, and relentlessly pursuing change. So grab your pens and notebooks as Judy Pearson takes us on a journey here on Right Medicine through the extraordinary life of Mary Lasker, a fascinating woman who rewrote the world of medicine. Welcome, Judy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Well, I appreciate uh, that you took time to be on the Right Medicine podcast because I know you have a lot going on at the moment. And I know that you are talking to lots of different podcasts and other outlets about your most recent book. So let's start off our conversation today just by talking a little bit about who you are and what you do. I started writing about the age of 12, sitting in a tree in my parents' backyard. It was, you know, all that preteen angst, you need to get out. And all these many decades later, it's absolutely my favorite thing to do. I had thought about becoming, well, I was in my original life right out of cancer. I was a French teacher. Then I went into advertising and marketing, but I started writing for publication about 20 years ago. And I I guess by default of ha- of being a cancer survivor, have sort of landed in this realm of the heroes and heroines in in the history of cancer and cancer treatment and health in general, actually, because I think judging from my last book in particular, where I did was the biography of the cancer survivorship movement, I spoke to a lot of oncology groups and, and uh, oncology nurses and they had never heard of the cancer survivorship movement and a lot of the people and organizations I was speaking about. So I thought, wow, okay, this is my niche. Oh, that's really interesting. And, you know, cancer survivorship has really 
increased over the last decade, maybe 15 years or so. It's kind of interesting to, it seems like there's a little bit more discussion and awareness of survivorship now. And certainly that's being factored into uh, the management of patients, the care of patients who are being treated for cancer. It, does that reflect your experience? Are you seeing that in the work that you're doing? It's the, the notion that cancer doesn't end when treatment does. In the very best of worlds, which is what I think I have, I am reminded every day I had breast cancer and a mastectomy. So, you know, every time I change clothes, I, I know I had cancer. And my drugs, for which I'm very grateful because they saved my life, the one in particular was a platinum-based drug that mm -hmm. is known to bother joints and cause neuropathy. And in my case, the pain settled in my ankles and feet. Mm -hmm. And so I have, that's why I live in the Southwest and, and I love the beach in Florida because I just need and crave the heat because mm -hmm. of the neuropathy. So those things, you know, your hair grows back, you fill back out after the chemotherapy, but no one recognizes what fallout there really is. And for some, it's, it's far greater with myriad branches of psychosocial and physical issues. So let's talk about uh, your most recent book. Your last book was on survivorship. Uh, this book is on somebody who really supported research into cancer. And I was thinking when you were talking, I'm sure you've read Siddhartha Mukherjee's book, Emperor of All mm -hmm. Maladies. And I, I was trying to think earlier and I couldn't find my copy of the book, whether he actually talks about Mary Lasker because he does. she is the subject of your of your most recent book. So tell us who Mary Lasker was and why you were particularly interested in her. She makes an appearance in the first chapter of my last book. So as I was writing this current one, Crusade to Heal America, I realized that this, I feel like a little bit like uh, George Lucas, this is really the prequel <laughs> to the last book. Interesting. So I was intrigued by, and, and I too read Emperor of All Maladies uh, shortly after it came out. And her name really didn't resonate with me until I did the little bit of research for the previous book. She was a most amazing, multifaceted woman far ahead of her time because her parents were far ahead of their time in terms of her mother in particular, who was an Irish immigrant. Mm -hmm. arrived um, in the late 1800s from the same town that the Titanic left from before it, it hit its ill-fated end. Mm -hmm. And Sarah, Mary's mother, believed in the importance of education for women and insisted that both Mary and her sister be educated. She believed in a woman having interests outside the home, business interests and social interests, she was very civic minded and she loved nature and the beauty of nature. And Mary really became the woman she was because of Sarah. And each of those elements played a very important part in her life. You named the book, you titled the book using the word crusade. Why, mm -hmm. why crusade? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Of course. So the first time Mary became aware, I guess you'd say, and I have to back up for just a second and tell you that Mary did an oral history over three decades worth for Columbia University in New York, and they thankfully transcribed it all. Mm -hmm. It wasn't perfect. And sometimes I'd find missing pages and let them know, and then they'd find the pages for me. But it's about 12, 1,200 pages. And although I had heard her voice, the vocal part of it is not online. So reading that and reading her thoughts in all elements of her life, all facets of her life, was really a fabulous insight. So she recalls this time that Sarah, her mother, took her to visit the family laundress, and they lived in a little town in Wisconsin. Her father was a very successful banker, so they had people who did things for them. And as they were going to visit the laundress, Mary was about five. Her mother said to her, now Mrs. Belter has had cancer and has had her breast removed. And Mary said, and this is Mary's recollection, you mean cut off? And 
Mrs. Woodard said, yes, she had surgery and had her breast cut off. And Mary said she arrived at this woman's house. She was lying on this low cot surrounded by these pitiful looking children. And Mary just could not believe the scenario, the fact that she'd had this surgery. I'm not sure whether her mind even went to, will this woman live? Mm -hmm. And the chances were probably not because only about one in four people survived cancer until the middle of the 20th century. And so it just, it really resonated with her. And then she became ill with the uh, Spanish flu. It was called the Mm -hmm. influenza pandemic of 1918. And she decided lying in the infirmary in college that if she was ever in a position to do something to help the suffering, to cure illnesses, she would do it. And she made good on it. And while she was interested in cancer and mental health, it wasn't until she married the fabulous Albert Lasker, her husband, that she really then had the means to do something as well. And the two of them just began this this crusade was the only way to describe it, changing the way cancer is researched and the way we look at it. So I definitely want to dig into that a little bit. She does sound like a very forthright woman. Absolutely. She she was a boss babe, I keep telling people. (laughs) The picture on the the cover of the book says it all. Well, yeah, no, I, I, I get that. There's been some fallout from the whole kind of boss babe concept but so we'll we'll put that to one side for the moment all right but i was also struck when you talked about the spanish flu that i wonder if you've read emma donahue's book oh gosh i forget the title i'll i'll try and remember it but it's about the spanish flu and it's uh from the perspective of a nurse working in an infirmary in dublin oh and wow it's beautiful it's a really i she wrote it at the beginning of the pandemic i think it was published last year but i would i would highly recommend it just kind Very of bringing that Irish experience and Spanish flu together. So let's get back to the the crusade. You've you've shared a little bit about Mary's personal interest in thinking about health and well being, and she seemed to be interested in all sorts of health issues, including birth control. Did she cross paths with Margaret Sanger? She did. Was she, she part did. of that circle? Both of them were New Yorkers, and Mary was a prodigious reader became even more so uh, down the road, but, you know, consumed newspapers as everybody did at that time and went to hear Margaret speak. And they actually became friends. And Margaret's story is very interesting. There are many facets to it that, and actually the organization, which at the time was called the Birth Control Federation of America Mm. and became later because of Albert Lasker Planned Parenthood, But there were directions that that organization went that were not quite what Margaret had planned. But in the beginning, it was, there was no birth control. It was illegal. You couldn't Mm -hmm. say the words in the newspaper. And Mary just thought that was unconscionable because women were trying to self-abort. And Margaret had gone to so many homes. She too was a nurse where women were bleeding out. And so Mary was fascinated by by this. And then mental health, aka, or not aka, but also in addition to a mental health organization that she belonged to, there was also the mental hygiene movement at the time Mm -hmm. where they Mm -hmm. believed that they could do things early on in a person's life that could maybe put off completely eradicate or at least assuage mental illnesses. Mm-hmm. So absolutely, she just she was fascinated by health. So what did Mary and Albert Lasker actually do? What what was the shape of their crusade? What were they interested in? What were they what kind of agenda were they pushing? The interesting thing was that they had similarities and they had areas that the other person wasn't familiar with, and those things blended so perfectly. So ironically, Albert had donated to both the American Society for the Control of Cancer, because his younger brother had died of cancer, Mm. and to Margaret Sanger's organization, unbeknownst 
to marry. When they met and started discussing all these areas of their lives, she realized that he had business and political experience and information. He's known as the father of modern advertising. He invented the names Sunkist and Sunsweet and Kleenex. And those things fascinated her. For her part, Mary had majored in art history at Radcliffe, Mm -hmm. had worked in two different galleries in New York City as a young woman right out of college, and had begun a small collection of her own. And Albert knew nothing about art, didn't understand it. And I don't know why people always think they have to understand it or they have to be educated in art to appreciate it. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And she taught him, you don't have to. And then she was also very good at bringing people together, putting people in the right place at the right time who could benefit one another. And so they collectively used their their skills and their interests after they married to further this health crusade that was a passion for both of them. Mary made a visit to the American Society for the Control of Cancer and asked what kind of research they were doing. And she was told none. And she was shocked. So she gave them a $5,000 donation, which is the equivalent of about 50000 today. They were using their money for pamphlets explaining the warning signs of cancer mm-hmm. and to fund the next year's fundraising. And so when she left, she said they didn't want to cure cancer. They just wanted to control it. So... I kind of lost my chain of thought there because uh, you you were talking about so many different uh, things that are you know potentially interesting to follow there. But I think one of the things that's interesting to me is the focus on research, right? You know what what drove that? Because I think we're talking about a period in a period in time when research wasn't well funded, it it wasn't institutionalized and organized in the way it is now. Why did she think research was going to be helpful? And how did she think research was going to be helpful? So after she left, after she made her donation and went back and talked to Albert, they decided they would take the American Cancer Society under their wing, which they did. They revamped it and Albert, with his business acumen, renamed it the American Cancer Society. So finding that there was no research there, they went to the Roosevelt Institute, now Roosevelt University, and heard the same thing, that no research is being done on cancer. And when they asked why, the executive director said, because there aren't any ideas to research. And this was sort of a chicken or the egg thing. You know, Mm. if you're not researching because there's no ideas and you're not going to start until there are ideas, where are the ideas going to come from if you don't start researching? So. They got home and decided that if there were no ideas, they better help grow some. So they created the Albert and Mary Lasker Foundation in 1940, and then two years later began making what Albert called research bargains, $1,000 prizes to people who had ideas and who wanted to pursue something. It's difficult for Americans to recognize this statement that I'm going to make. But many doctors and researchers were going to Europe to learn in the first half of the 20th century because medicine and research was so much further along, so Mm. much more embraced. And so the Laskers just decided that wasn't going to do it all. And and as an aside, the Lasker Foundation is still very much in existence. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'm going to their annual luncheon the end of September to uh, see them present this year's awards, which are now two prizes, which are now two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Wow. <laughs> They're known as the American Nobels. So they just realized that the idea that disease, cancer and heart disease, which was killing or which was responsible for seventy five percent of the deaths in America at that time, it was ridiculous just to throw up your hands and say it's God's will. Mm-hmm. there there must be something someone who could make changes in that area. So they were pragmatists. Very much. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I did see that, 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 isn't this the 75th anniversary of the Lasker Foundation? That was actually a couple of years ago. So let's see, 1940. 
Okay, so that yeah, but they've been around for a, a very a very long time. And the and the prizes were since 1942. So they they funded or Mary Lasker funded research. She brought people together. What would she have said was her top three achievements? Well, you know, I had a picture of her sitting on my desk the whole time I was writing, and. I just would look at her and say, I know you're not going to like this. <laughs> she was very happy being the catalytic agent. She called herself in the background, making things happen. But, and she did say that after her death, her oral history could be released. And then she also said at one point in time, my, my life might even make a good book. And I kind of chuckled at that because I, I said to her, oh, yes, it does. <laughs> so I think. The first step would have been she always gave credit to Albert. So the name change of the American Cancer Society and bringing cancer out of the closet. Mm -hmm. It couldn't be mentioned. It had never been mentioned on the airwaves. And because of Albert's advertising connections and the amount of airtime that he purchased for advertising, he persuaded the network that carried Fibber, McGee, and Molly to let Molly and McGee do a little skit at the end of one of the shows talking about cancer and donating to the new American Cancer Society. So that was huge. He also insisted that she understand the money she was seeking for research needed to come from something greater than just personal donations, whether it be small ones or those of the level that they could afford. Mm -hmm. So he taught her that the greatest source of funding was the government because he'd worked on the shipping board early in the 20th century. So learning how to navigate the halls of Congress, learning how to lobby, learning the biggest lesson was that just because Congress approves something doesn't mean there's money. Once mm -hmm. it's approved, then it goes through the appropriation process and that's where the money comes from. So that that was probably the first greatest lesson and achievement and just getting people to start thinking about research, medical research. Because listen, disease, as we all know, it's not a Republican or a Democratic issue. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a frail body that can get disease. So she learned how to bring, which is difficult to imagine in these days, the Republicans and the Democrats together to get this done. Then I think probably the second her second greatest accomplishment was the notion that we think out of the box in terms of this research. So she said to President Johnson, because she was friends with the Kennedys, friends with the Johnsons, mm -hmm. friends with the Roosevelts. And she said to him, you know, we're working on a moonshot because this was before we'd landed on the moon. Why don't we think about a moonshot for inner space rather than outer space. And that moonshot would be for cancer. So she originated the phrase, oh, a moonshot for cancer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she was really thinking what needed to happen was a NASA type organization, which was completely independent of the National Science Foundation and the National Air or the uh, Air Department of Aeronautics and the Air Force, completely independent, whose sole focus, so the bureaucracy was cut, sole focus was on, on outer space. And she wanted the same thing for cancer because by this time, by the 1960s, the National Cancer Institute was so bogged down in bureaucracy. Mm. And she just really felt it either needed to be removed from NIH or it, there needed to be a completely separate organization. <clears throat> that didn't happen. But what did happen as a result of that, so, so getting people to think outside the box was big. What did happen as a result of all of that was the signing of the 1971 National Cancer Act. Mm -hmm. There is so much political intrigue that swirled around that that was so fun to write. That was really the culmination of her career. President Nixon had many perceived enemies. He was very paranoid. He was already worried about the 1972 election and having to run against another Kennedy. Senator Ted Kennedy just wanted redemption. He wanted Chappaquiddick behind him. He needed something that could get his name away from the scandal. 
and Mary on her crusade to heal America and wanting to cure cancer realized that those two giants of government needed to come together Mm. in the name of her crusade. And the $1.8 billion that that signing sent into medical research, that changed the future for survivors forever after that. That is so interesting. Thinking about out-the-box thinking, as you were writing the book, did you start to think about out-of-the-box thinking that we need to be doing now to you know, pursue Mary's agenda? I think I did. And, and qu- quite honestly, she did as well. She had a, another great idea that I'll talk about in a minute. But we've gotten much better in the cancer world, and that's the world with which I'm most familiar, in doing things that even a decade ago, when I was diagnosed, were fantasy immunotherapy, teaching the body's immune system to go after cancer cells, you know, like little, a little Pac-Man game. That's, that's just crazy, but it works. And it's just, you know, I, I have friends who are living proof. It's just fascinating how those kinds of things are possible. Isaac Asimov, who I'm sure you're familiar with, the scientific writer and author and scientist said that the the most exciting words in science are not eureka but huh that's interesting and that's exactly yeah. true finding these little mistakes stumbling forward we our country is very good at doing that militarily and it's really how we turned the tide of world war 2 but we're now getting really good at doing it on a on a medical scale as well and a research scale as well yeah, immunotherapy is an interesting example. Obviously, it's been a, a clinical game changer over the last, well, I think 2012 was the, the first approval for uh, Yervoy, the first cancer immunotherapy drug. But, mm-hmm. but James Allison had a really challenging path to get his work recognized. And of course, he is the, the you know, kind of created the foundation for thinking about the power of immunotherapy as a, an anti-cancer approach. What about your writing process itself? You've, you've mentioned a couple of times you had a lot of fun writing this book and you have access to oral, Mary's oral history. And oral history itself is, is kind of a, a dying art. It is. Yeah, there, it was very popular at the beginning of the 20th century, I think well into the 1950s, certainly in Europe. I can't speak for, for the US. So that's kind of interesting on its own. What was your, can you describe, describe a little bit about your writing process and how you approach your research? Sure. And happily, there are a number of organizations that are still doing oral histories today. Oh, so yeah. some are university mm-hmm. affiliated, some are organization affiliated. So I'm, I'm really glad for that. <laughs> That's a really good yeah. thing. It's a fantastic resource. Yes, absolutely. So I, I'm a very disciplined writer. I go into my office at nine o'clock in the morning and I work until the dog comes in and says, it's time for dinner. And <laughs> so then I close up shop. But it is not unknown for me to jump up in the middle of the night and tell my husband, I'll be right back. And then an hour later, he'll find me writing away because I have a thought. Mm-hmm. Never trust your memory in the middle of the night. You will never remember. I hear you there. (laughs) (laughs) I used to just simply keep paper and pencil next to my bed. And one morning I woke up and there was a note that said refrigerator. And I have no idea to this day (laughs) what that meant. So now I get out of bed. But I, for me, the outlining process is important. And I did that. My first two books were actually novels that are not published, but I even, I outlined those. I guess it's, it's my nature. I'm very organized and there's a wonderful writing platform that writing program that was primarily created for fiction writers, but I've made it work for me as well. And it makes it a little bit easier because you can open so many things from one application as opposed to going to your word document and your spreadsheet and you're this and you're that. Mm. And I try to. I I start a book by doing 
about three or four months worth of research, sort of outlining where I see it going. Nonfiction books and biographies like mine are sold to publishers by proposal. So you have to know enough Mm -hmm. about your prospect or about your, your topic to make that proposal, even if you're going back to the same publisher. And Mayo Clinic Press is a wonderful partner and, and they're picking, they've picked up my next book as well. That's great. It is. It really is. So that's a little bit easier. But so, but I do about four months worth of research. I'll tell you, I actually do present to writers workshops a presentation called Confessions of a Research Junkie, which I am. <laughs> But I believe with all my heart that research, really good research, can improve any writing, whether all you're doing is some kind of business letter, or you're writing a book, or somewhere in between. So I subscribe to a newspaper database that was created for genealogy research, but it works fantastically for me. And it's hundreds of thousands of English language newspapers back to the 1500s. So I can access newspapers of the period that I'm writing in, not only to research my subject, but I want to know maybe what the weather was on a particular day, what movies were were being shown, what was the the price of a pound of coffee? Mm-hmm. You know, what did they think about a particular item in the news or something in government? And so I really rely heavily on that for lots of color both in the proposal process and in the outlining. And then, you know, it's like following the yellow brick road. The only way to begin is to begin. (laughs) One of the things that I, so I'm wondering if you can share the name of the outlining platform, first of all. Absolutely. I didn't know if I could do that or not. It's called Scrivener. Scrivener. I wondered if you were talking about Scrivener. I've used Scrivener a little bit, and I'm pretty sure that there are listeners uh, to the podcast who probably use Scrivener as well. So I know what you're talking about, and I'll definitely put a link to the show notes in that, but that one of the things that a lot of medical writers, you know, talk about, of course, is going down the rabbit hole and knowing (laughs) when to stop. When (laughs) do you know it's time to stop, Judy? I need a support group. So if you could link, (laughs) if you could link us together, (laughs) the other research junkies, and just as a quick anecdote, My brother called me one day about 11 o'clock in the morning, and I was at the point where I was talking about 1968, and President Nixon was about to be elected, but Martin Luther King had been assassinated, Bobby Kennedy had been assassinated, and so I was researching the day Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. My brother is an executive for Coca-Cola. It's not like he's just sitting home on a sheep ranch somewhere. We spent about two hours, both of us, looking up Bobby Kennedy assassination conspiracy theories. I spent the rest of the day reading about it, and it got one sentence. So I literally have to put a sticky note on my monitor that says, does this move the story forward? And and I really, you know, sometimes you need more, but often I have too much. Although... I I don't ever throw anything away. I don't I don't trash anything because either there might be something else on that website in that newspaper article that I'll remember. And this is where Scrivener is the greatest help because when I'm taking notes as well as when I'm writing the manuscript, off to the side there's a little note section. And that's where I log the website or the source mm. of everything that I'm saying. Cause I've done that to myself before too, where I've written something and then not been able, I don't do footnotes and the end notes are at the end of the chapter and very discreet. Cause I don't want it to interrupt the flow, mm-hmm. but I, I, that's really important to remember as your audience will know, if you write something and you can't back it up, somebody will come get you. <laughs> No, absolutely. A hundred percent. And also you do need a really good system to kind of store and retrieve information. And I agree. I, I, I don't throw things out either when I'm researching, you know, if I'm researching for one project and you get to the final or the penultimate draft and you realize, okay, you're going to have to do some ruthless pruning. And it's always the thing you're 
pretty attached to for one reason or another earlier in the research and writing process that that has to go, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a place for it somewhere else. Well, and often I've found that the somewhere else is maybe in the marketing, and clearly not the assassination mm. of Robert Kennedy, but <laughs> somewhere in the marketing, I did have to cut at the end, uh, I don't know, I think about 30 or 50,000 words. And the book still came in at 300,000. But but there are phrases in what I cut out that are great little teasers for social media mm. or maybe a blog post down the road or an article or something like that. No, that's great. Money obviously solves a lot of problems, or it can do, and the Laskers had money. But were there obstacles that Mary faced in the work that she was trying to do? And, and how did she kind of face those obstacles? There certainly were. And what her money allowed her, and she actually was a successful business ma- businesswoman in, in her own right before she met Albert. And then, of course, you know, his amazing success and, and huge fortune. And she kept saying to him, I won't be a kept woman. Her father was somewhat frugal. And Mary hated the fact that her mother, despite, well, their, their comfort, Mary hated the fact that her mother had to go ask her father for money and then he mm. wanted to know why. And she just re- just said to herself, I'm never going to be put in that position. And uh, Albert thought it was funny that she insisted that, but she did. So there were certainly limits to what even her money could buy. But it what it did buy her was the ability to entertain And to move in social circles, both in Washington and in New York, that were helpful. And there was a dinner party, in fact, that they had thrown for about a dozen people. They had a a very large seven-story townhouse in Manhattan. And they had this dinner party going on. And somebody said something completely non-related. And Mary said, speaking of that, let me tell you about this work that I'm doing with Congressman so-and-so in trying to enlarge the appropriations for the Institute of the Blind and she or of the Eye. And she started off down this path. And Albert finally said, Mary, stop talking about this GD research and let's just get back to dinner. <laughs> and so then she would smile and go back to, to dinner. But the social circles and the ability for her to go to a congressman and say, I'm having a party. I'd like you to come. And they would come was Mm -hmm. pretty amazing. The other interesting thing was the fact that they collected, certainly by the time Albert sadly died of cancer himself in 1952, Mm -hmm. they call it abdominal cancer, but I think it was either colon. I think it was colon. It was, they, sometimes it was talked about as abdominal, sometimes intestinal. I think it was probably colon cancer. Mm -hmm. And she went on collecting just amazing art. Well, there were times when the foundation was falling short of funds and she sold pieces of art to keep the foundation uh, alive. And we're talking original Renoirs and Manets Mm -hmm. and and Degas and Picasso and Dali's. And then she got really interested in the 1980s in the substance called interferon which is oh, interesting. found uh-huh. in the blood. It's extremely difficult to procure, lots of steps to get just a tiny bit. And the majority, the research for that was actually being done in Scandinavia, in Finland. And she sent a doctor who's still alive that I was able to interview. And oh, her friend who was, she had a couple of gal pals who were really interested in this whole medical research arena. And she sold a collection of Fujitas. Fujita was a French-Japanese impressionist. And she sold her paintings for about a million dollars in order to send them over there and buy up as much interferon for research back here in America as possible. So, you know, the idea that a prolific art enthusiast could put their art to work in a different way other than just donating the paintings at their death or sending them around on exhibition is pretty cool. That is very cool. I'm also thinking that she must have been painted herself. Only once. 
And do you know where that painting, who, who, paint, who painted her? Dolly painted her. And oh, interesting. The, the painting, he did some, he, he, he's known for like the dripping clock and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Oh, but surreal. he actually, yeah. that's right. But he actually did a number of impressionistic paintings that aren't nearly as difficult to discern. And so it is a beautiful piece hanging in the Lasker Foundation office, but it in New York, but it is also, I found it in uh, one of the magazine articles that I uh, used as part of my research. It was in, I think it was McCall's, like McCall's magazine used that as the lead in to their article. Oh, it that's really, really yeah. beautiful. Mm-hmm. Mary, yeah, Mary loved the color blue. Mm-hmm. Which is, I looked up the meaning of blue and it's very much related to health and well being. So it was perfect. She had very beautiful blue, Irish blue eyes. And uh, so she wore all shades of blue. So she was wearing blue in this painting as well. But the reason for blue was that it made it very easy to accessorize when she traveled. So if everything she wore was blue, she knew what jewelry went with it, what scarves went with it, what shoes went with it, made it much simpler. So a forthright woman who's also deliberate and intentional and pretty disciplined too, it sounds like. Absolutely. And so final question for you, Judy, What's what do you think is the most important lesson from Mary's life? And, uh, and how can we kind of use that to think about what we should be doing in medical research today? I refer back to this quote all the time, and it wasn't until I wrote this book that I realized it's the quote that's driven all my writing. And that's from the the cultural anthropologist, Margaret Mead, who oh, said, yeah. ne- never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, concerned citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I think that is absolutely true. An individual may not have the connections and the money that Mary Lasker did, but that's no reason to not try to change the world, even in a small way. And, and you'll be shocked to learn what catches fire and, and how things can grow from your little inspired work that, that you learned from somewhere else. Judy Pearson, author, cancer survivor, and something of a catalytic agent herself. Thank you so <laughs> much for sharing your wisdom and insights with listeners of Right Medicine. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Hope you'll have me on again. That would be wonderful. Next book, right? You bet. If you'd like to connect with me or today's guest or access any of the resources we talked about, check out the show notes for this episode. They're on my website where you'll also find additional resources. Find the show notes at alexhausen.com forward slash write w-r-i-t-e dash medicine dash podcast and while you're there don't forget to subscribe to the right medicine newsletter where you'll find bi-weekly tips tools and resources to help you create continuing medical education content with confidence and thank you for listening today word of mouth is the most meaningful way we can help listeners find us and reach a wider audience So please share this episode with a friend, a colleague, or a client who might find the podcast helpful. And if you enjoy listening to the podcast, please write a favorable review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or share your testimonial on the dedicated testimonial link, which is also in the show notes.